Hi everyone, salam alaikum. My name is Noor Kara, and I'm a fourth year in the college as well as the outreach coordinator on our Muslim Students Association. Welcome to the University of Chicago's International House and to our Global Voices Author Night. The Global Voices Author Night series is a popular public book series organized as a collaborative project with the International House Global Voices Program and the Seminary Co-op Bookstore. For this evening's program, co-sponsored by the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, I have the pleasure of introducing two phenomenal women. Aisha Matu is a writer, editor, and international development consultant who has worked in the field of women's human rights since 1998. She was selected a Muslim leader of tomorrow by the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations and has served on the boards of International Development Exchange, the Women's Funding Network, and World Pulse. Ms. Matu has also worked in Pakistan, where she helped address the issue of child sexual abuse. She is an alumna of Voices of Our Nations and a member of the San Francisco Writers' Grotto. Noura Masnabi is a civil rights attorney, writer, and Fulbright scholar. She has worked with Muslim Advocates, a national legal advocacy organization, where she led its program to end racial and religious profiling. Prior to that, Ms. Musnavi litigated prisoner rights class actions on behalf of California state prisoners. She has also served as a staff attorney for the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. During her Fulbright, she worked with local and international non-governmental organizations in Sri Lanka on issues affecting Sri Lankan migrant workers. Ms. Matu and Ms. Masnavi co-edited their previous book, Love Inshallah, The Secret Love Lives of American Muslim Women, which was featured globally by media outlets, including the New York Times, NPR, BBC, and Times of India. This evening, we will learn more about their most recent book, Salam Love, American Muslim Men on Love, Sex, and Intimacy, in which 22 American Muslim men from differing ethnic, racial, and religious perspectives openly share their takes on romance and relationships, reflecting the strength and diversity of their faith community. Their presentation will be followed by a 15 minute question and answer session, and thereafter feel free to purchase either of the books um, to my right. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Aisha Matu and Noura Masnavi. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Noor, for that introduction. Um, thank you to the International House, the Seminary Co-op, and the Center for Middle Eastern Studies here at the University of Chicago for sponsoring this event. This is my hometown now. As of a year and a half ago, I lived just up the street, so I'm excited to be here. Um, and I'm really excited that it warmed up today because I got back from Atlanta where it was 60 degrees on Sunday night and I thought I was going to cry yesterday. Um, but so it's a beautiful day and I'm so happy to be here. Um, we are here today to talk about our newest collection, Salam Love, American Muslim Men on Love, Sex, and Intimacy. But I'm going to start off by talking about how we got here. And, um, and that was with our first book, Love Inshallah, which was released two years ago. But this entire journey started about seven years ago um, when I was living in San Francisco. Uh, Aisha and I were good friends, uh, chatting over coffee, talking about how there is this perception and portrayal of Muslim women out there in the media that we didn't recognize. We didn't recognize in ourselves. We didn't recognize in the incredible Muslim women we saw around us. Um, and we wanted to change that. We wanted to tell real stories, um, real issues that Muslim women are facing, and we decided to do that through the lens of love. And we chose love because it's a beautiful, universal emotion that really transcends boundaries of race and ethnicity and faith. And through love stories, we can see ourselves reflected in each other. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to connect intimately and um, through each other's hearts. So we put this book out two years ago, and it was incredible. Uh, the response we got was very inspiring. We heard from women across the country and world saying that the stories resonated with them. They saw themselves reflected. Um, and then we started hearing from men. So with that, I'm going to turn to Aisha to talk a little bit about what all the men said to us about the book. 
Assalamu alaikum, everybody. So when Noura says we started hearing from the men, what she actually means is we started being stalked <laughs> by Muslim men, in a good way. <laughs> and um, we started being taken aside at dinner parties. We started receiving emails. And these men were all asking the same question, which was, where are our stories? And at first, our response was, please, that would be the shortest collection in the world because men simply don't talk about their feelings. Um, and then we started asking ourselves the question, which is, is it that men don't speak about their feelings or is it that they don't have the space to address those feelings? So um, it, on one level, it sounds really absurd because it seems that every corner corporate office and all the way up to the White House is occupied by men who are exercising power and occupying space. But um, we decided to ask them to share their search for love, to provide um, an equal space and opportunity to them on this women-led and created platform of the first book and of our ongoing website, loveinshallah.com, to come on and tell their stories. So we asked them, what does it mean to be a man? How do you um, prove to be a constant and faithful companion? How do you make love work over the long term? What do you do if you've had your heart broken or if you've broken someone else's heart? How do you move on from that? How do you recover from that? And they told us, the stories began to pour in. And they poured in from all around the country, from men who were single, married, divorced, widowed, um, from men uh, from a diverse range of ethnic and racial backgrounds, um, and also from men who identified as secular, orthodox, and cultural Muslims. So it's actually one of the rare spaces in both of these books where Muslims from a very diverse range of perspectives, I would say diverse and divergent, actually can come together and witness each other's lives in a very intimate and personal way. In the book, we have 22 stories um, from uh, American Muslim men, and we strongly believed that so much has been said about American Muslim men and Muslim men generally, and it's time that we listened to their stories in their own words. I'm going to uh, introduce the writers. Molly's going to speak first. We actually tonight ha have the pleasure of having one of our contributors from Love Inshallah here. And she's going to read first. So Molly Elian Carlson converted to Islam in 2005 and then converted to marriage in 2007 to the man of her dreams, literally. She was born in Minnesota, but has lived in many other places, including Cairo, Egypt. She, her husband, and the Egyptian street cat she took in moved back to Minnesota in 2009 and lived there currently. She loves to read and to write and hopes to one day publish that novel that has been sitting in the back of her head for years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I thought I was going to sit here and read. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. All right. So. I okay. So I wrote this story about how I met my my wonderful husband. Um, both, you know. After conversion, I converted um, two years actually before getting married. Two years actually, well, a year before I knew my husband, back, you know. So uh, I give in my story, which is called a Kyrene kind of love. Kyrene, obviously, meaning from Cairo. Um, so I give my story about how I, because I, I grew up in a very Latino area, so I speak English and Spanish. And before I converted to Islam, I was Catholic, and I went to a Catholic church, and. Um, I wanted to find a convert who also spoke Spanish, which turned out to be really hard. So the beginning of my story kind of talks about that, and then um, later how I met my husband. So um, I will start in kind of the middle of my story uh, at when I finally met him face to face, because we knew each other online as friends first. 
After I graduated from college, I flew to Turkey with my mom to celebrate with a Mediterranean cruise. After my father left us, it was just her and me, and she was the closest person in the world to me. She'd always been right about my life decisions so thus far, so I wanted her to meet Muhammad and uh, give me her advice. She knew a little about him, but I kept my feelings close to my heart. I was still nervous and unsure of what the future held for me in terms of my relationship with him. Four days into the trip, we landed on the shores of Egypt, where he was waiting. He met us directly at the door of the port of entry into the city of Alexandria. I'd like to say that rainbows erupted and symphonies played when we first made eye contact, but the truth is, I was so nervous that my teeth chattered and I couldn't stop talking or grinning like an idiot until about five hours into our first day together. It was very early in the morning when we arrived, so almost nothing was open. We were a group of five altogether, the driver, our tour guide, who was a close friend of Muhammad's, my mother, Muhammad, and me. Finding that none of the sightseeing locations were open yet, we stopped to have a typical Egyptian breakfast of fool and tamaya sandwiches at a small cafe. We ate at a leisurely pace and enjoyed the morning's cool weather. I was still so nervous that I didn't know what to do with myself. I wasn't sure if I should eat or talk, look at Muhammad or not look at him, and so confused that I often did all of those things at once. I was captivated by him, but painfully shy and embarrassed, and I could tell that he felt the same way. After we had finished breakfast, it was still too early to enter the Kite Bay Citadel, so we set off on a walk along the wharf next to it so we could talk alone. My mom and the rest of the group trailed not far behind us, so they kept at a respectful distance. Standing on the rocks with Muhammad, I decided that I wanted to get closer to the edge and look into the water, but as I inched forward, I slipped on some algae. I would have landed in the water had he not caught me. Afterward, I wasn't sure which was worse, which hurt, which hurt worse, my scraped foot or my bruised pride, but at least he knew exactly what he was getting into with clumsy, accident-prone me. There was no false advertising here. Muhammad had convinced one of his best friends, a tour guide, to give us a private tour of Alexandria and Cairo, but I was too engrossed in shyly watching Muhammad and to listen to what his friend said during our expedition. Later, as we descended into the catacombs of Komal Shukafa, I slipped for a second time on some gravel and would have fallen again if Muhammad hadn't bear, been there to catch me. As we ascended from the gloom back into the bright light of the day, I heard my first call to prayer in a Muslim city with Muhammad at my side. I had never heard anything as beautiful as the echo of the voices around us. Looking up into Muhammad's face, I felt at peace with myself and I could picture the possibility of a future with him. My mother approved of Muhammad and spoke repeatedly of repeatedly of how respectful and kind he was. After our two-day two excursion in Egypt had ended and we were back on the cruise ship, she turned to me. You're going to marry him, aren't you? She asked. Until that point, I, haven't even, I hadn't even mentioned the possibility to her, but the question shocked me into complete honesty. Maybe. I would be okay with that. He's a good guy, she threw out casually, too consumed with hanging her clothes to see how bowled over I was by her announcement. I knew that she had gotten along well with him, but I hadn't expected her to be so accepting so quickly of the idea of her only child getting married. Thank you, Molly. Now we will have a speaker from Salam Love, Arif Chowdhury, is a writer, filmmaker, stand-up comic, and a professional storyteller. Storyteller. In his storytelling program entitled More in Common Than You Think, Arif shares stories about growing up Bangladeshi American Muslim in the north suburbs of Chicago and pokes fun at issues of ethnic and religious identity, assimilation, and how we think of one another. He wrote a children's book, The Only Brown-Skinned Boy in the Neighborhood, and his short film, film Coloring, is currently being presented in various film festivals. He lives in New York City. Uh, so my story is called, How Did I End Up Here? Uh, and it's about the frustrations of trying to find the special person that I wanted to share my life with. Um, and so uh, during my search, I decided that um, my mother and I were going to go to Bangladesh to take care of some family things and that um, maybe I would meet that person while on that trip. 
Two days before returning to Chicago, Shaju, my cousin, her older brother Musa, his daughter Nur Jahan, and I drove to an upscale mall to meet the girl <laughs> and her mother. I wasn't even told the girl's name. Nur Jahan was giddy. She was nine years old and felt very grown up for being invited. I love Nur Jahan, she's my niece, but she made me nervous. During my entire visit to Dhaka, she'd been poking my belly. I had a pot belly and was calling me fatso. <laughs> I had hoped to hide how heavy I was with my outfit, but wouldn't be able to hide it if during a conversation with the girl, Nur Jahan poked me in the belly and I giggled like the Pillsbury Doughboy. It was Ramadan, so no one was eating or drinking, but the ghotok, the matchmaker, decided that we should all meet at a snack shop on the second floor of this mall. We arrived to find the ghotok, chubby, in her 50s, wearing glasses and white hijab, sitting alone at one of the snack shop's dozen or so formica tables. Shaju walked up to her first and gave her her salam. When I gave the ghotok my salam, she looked me up and down and said, you're not very tall. Ouch, I was in trouble. The Ghotok hadn't known what I looked like, and my heart sank. I too had come to the date blind. I had no idea what the girl looked like. But that was okay, as I was desperate to meet someone, anyone on this trip. But if the Ghotok didn't know what I looked like, that meant the girl and her family didn't know either. No matter how smart, witty, charming, or accomplished I was, she could reject me if she did not find me attractive. She might think I'm fat. I am fat. <laughs> Not horribly fat, but I could stand to lose 20 pounds or so. And like the Ghotok said, at five feet six inches, I'm not very tall. Bangladeshis are not very tall people, but everybody seems to want a tall groom for their daughter. Maybe they're planning to breathe a short gene out. Thank Allah I wasn't bald. We all stood up as they entered the snack shop, first the brother of the girl walked in and introduced himself, then the girl, her mother, and an aunt walked in and sat down next to Shaju and the Ghotok. The girl was taller than me, at least five, eight inch, eight inches, five feet eight inches. She was wearing flip-flops to decrease her perceived height. Her mother stood for a while and stared at me, examining me as if I were a prize bull for sale. Her face crinkled up, as though she smelled a bucket of rotten eggs. She gave me another glance and then sat down and whispered to the aunt. The men chatted among the men. The ladies chatted among the ladies. I noticed that the girl giggled whenever I spoke in my American accented Bengali. And soon it was all over. I didn't even get a chance to talk to the girl. Neither the mother nor the girl asked me any questions, which I took as an indication of uninterest. After the meeting, I told Shaju to call them and let them know that I was still interested. I wasn't, but she was still a prospect. Who knows, I thought. It might lead to something. It didn't. After my trip to Bangladesh, I decided to try every method of dating possible. This was now a full-time job. I would use the Rishta process, online dating, Muslim speed dating, setups by friends and family, and attend events where young Muslim professionals congregate. The only way I was able to get through was by being hopeful that I might actually find the one. I am 37 and single, and I'm trying to be okay with that. There is an advantage to being a single guy. I lead a pretty full life. I've shot documentary films in China and India, taught improv comedy in Beijing and Singapore, written short stories, films, plays, songs, and a children's book. I perform as a storyteller and stand-up comic all around the United States and also overseas. I work on social justice causes and build bridges between people of different faith traditions and cultural backgrounds. All of this is fun and exciting, but sometimes it feels less meaningful without someone special with whom I can share these experiences. There are constant reminders that everyone else is coupled up except for me. I attended a Bangladeshi Muslim wedding in which the bride and the groom were both divorcees. Somehow they found each other. They were on their second marriage while I wasn't even on my first. At times I feel lonely and demoralized, worthless, and as unappreciated as the last piece of chocolate in a Whitman sampler. <laughs> the appealing chocolates have been eaten. Most people have read my description and taken a pass. Or they took a bite out of me, didn't like my unfamiliar taste, and put me back in the box, half eaten, alone, waiting to be thrown out. 
My sister says I'm a catch. I know what she's trying to say, that I'm reasonably handsome, educated, well-spoken, funny, and fun to be with. I have a passion for life, and I want to help people. I want to leave the world a better place than I found it. I have a keen knowledge of culture, both high and low. I can quote Shakespeare and The Simpsons. I like Ravel and The Rolling Stones. I can wax intelligent on the West Coast offense and West Coast jazz. However, it's hard to think of myself as a catch when I've been single this long, when I just can't find the one. Still, I've got a full schedule this week. I've got a date with a girl I met online, and a few more biodatas have been emailed to me. <laughs> I'm trying to be optimistic, but who knows what the future will bring. Thank you. Thank you, Ara, for that. Well, we um, have a treat. Uh, one of our, we've been continuing the conversation that was inspired by Salam Love and Love Inshallah on our website, loveinshallah.com, where we get stories from contributors from around the world, writers from around the world. And one of our columnists uh, is right here in Chicago, Ihsan Tahir. And she writes a column called Single in the City. And Ihsan will be moderating our Q&A with the writers. Ihsan? Hello, hello. Hi, my name is Ahsan. Um, like Nura said, I'm one of the columnists for loveinshallah.com. As many of you know, Nura and Aisha, they've been traveling. Um, they've been to San Francisco, they've been to DC, they've been to Atlanta, they saved the best city for last. Yeah. So. <laughs> and they picked a great day because it's 70 degrees in Chicago. So. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna get started with the questions. I know a couple people are probably shy, um, you know, but I guess I'll start off with the first question. Uh, you know, I was here when they released the first book, Love Inshallah, Secret Love Lives of American Muslim Women. And I mean, the room wasn't packed like this at all. I remember it was probably like, what, 15 people maybe? It, maybe more. Okay, fine. There were more people, <laughs> more than 15 people. But um, one of my friends had told me about the book. And I decided to go. I went with Fahima. I don't know if she's here. I don't see her. Okay, she's not here. But Fahima told me about the book. And, you know, it was there was nothing like it out there. So we were all excited to go. Um, but my first question is to you guys, comparing the first book to the, to the book that just came out, I noticed, and Nuna and I have talked about it a little bit, uh, so I guess this question is more for Aisha, but I've noticed that the brothers are very vocal, which I think is great. You know, the brothers are very vocal. Uh, with the first book, there was some hesitancy from the women's side. I guess women writing under pen names. I don't know if that's been the case with the brothers writing under pen names, but what are some contrasts that you guys noticed based on the first release compared to the second release? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I th there's a couple of differences uh, that sort of stand out. One is that uh, the first book was actually five years from conception to publication, so we had a much longer period to really build relationships with all of the writers. And there was a hesitancy um, um, from some of the writers about sharing their stories. And it was sort of like one of the writers said, it's like peeling back layers of an onion and getting down to the core of it. And we had time to work on that. Um, so our, if with the second book, uh, we had five months to put it together. And so it's a very compressed time frame, And we were worried that perhaps the writers um, it's going to be difficult to get them to be vulnerable to go to that core of their story in that uh, time frame. And yet what we found was that the men were sort of absolutely ready to go there right away. You know, the first draft that they sent us, they were sort of like, here's my story. And so there was some finessing and nuance that we sort of helped them um, do through some questions and editing, but really the stories were, they were ready to tell their story. Now I think part of that is that Love Inshallah has been around for a couple of years and we have an online platform and this conversation has been ongoing. It's also that it's an established platform where women have invited men to join them. Many of the writers told us that um, they were inspired by the first book to take part in the second book. But I do think um, that there is um, a gendered difference as well to some degree where um, many of the women hesitated even to share what might be fairly innocuous um, physical or emotional interactions with um, the opposite sex, for example, which was not apparent in the book with um, 
the men, the second book. Um, I would say there's also been somewhat of a shift in the community reaction. Um, I think that overwhelmingly both books have been positively received, but if there has been pushback, um, it's largely been targeted towards the first book um, in somewhat of a shaming and silencing of some of the women's stories. Whereas there are very controversial issues as well as very joyful and humorous issues um, in the second book as well. But even for the controversial issues, um, there has been a community support of those issues being raised as real issues that need to be looked at by the community. And so I think it's a really interesting um, change over the last couple of years. Some of it is gendered, some of it is platform related. Okay. All right, thank you, Aisha. All right, so moving on to the audience. Any questions? Everybody's shy. <laughs> Do we have the pen and paper? Or no? Did they write that question? All right, go ahead. Yes, the, the question was, how was I able to find the courage to be open and honest about this cha the challenges of finding that special person? I am happy to report to you that I'm actually recently married. So, <laughs> you know, uh, my wife and my sister are like, tell people that there's, <laughs> that things can happen. Because yeah. it, it gets it's a little bit dark and, and, and uh, demoralizing near the end of it, you know. Uh, and so, so, uh, so where did I find the courage? Um, well, let me tell you, uh, two things. I'm a shameful self-promoter. <laughs> I, um, am a per I'm a, I used to be a stand-up comic primarily, and then September 11th happened, and then people asked me questions about faith and ethnicity and so on. So I started becoming an uh, interfaith and intercultural storyteller. So I started telling true stories of my life. I used to do a uh, routine at Zany's called Don't Kick My Ass, I'm Not a Terrorist that got a lot of notice, and then people asked me to do it in schools. And I thought, that's a nightclub act. <laughs> And that's not true. I have not been, luckily, a hate crime victim. But I played that character and persona on stage. So in my uh, transition from stand-up comic primarily to storyteller and comic, um, I started to learn to share my personal stories. And so I, I tell stories about, like in my children's book, The Only Brown Skin Boy in the Neighborhood, that's about me growing up in Northbrook, where Ferris Bueller is from. Right? <laughs> so that helped having that uh, history. However, I will tell you still that it was challenging to uh, go back to that dark place where I felt lonely and demoralized. Uh, what happened was when the first uh, book um, event happened, the Love and Shell Love event um, here in University of Chicago, I was hoping to go to that event to pick up chicks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm only half kidding, okay? <laughs> Because my sister's a civil rights attorney and a friend of Nura's, and while I was shooting my short film, Coloring, about growing up in Northbrook as a brown-skinned boy, based on my children's book, my sister said, you need to meet Nura. She's writing comedy. She, she wrote this book. Uh, she edited this book and contributed a story called Life, Inshallah. Uh, get that book. Go to that event. It was two days before I was shooting, so I, I didn't go. Um, but I later met Nura um, a few months later, and uh, she, I was telling her about my issues because I was going to try to get her to set me up with Muslim women. <laughs> uh, I'm serious, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so she, I was telling her these little bits that I was turning into a performance piece. This uh, story was going to become a performance piece because I personally feel that if I suffer challenges and tragedy, I have to use that in some kind of a positive way whether it allows other people to empathize with it, uh, or if it allows me to experience some catharsis and let go of it, or if I can get paid for performing it. <laughs> um, so all of that kind of helped. But it was dark to go back to that place to write the story, especially because I was <laughs> in love when I was writing it and uh, engaged to be married uh, to my now wife. And so it was a weird uh, bipolar thing going on where I was really happy during the day and then thinking, man, I deserve her, you know, after all this, like, <laughs> nonsense I've been through, dang, you know. So it was, uh, 
I think being in love with her allowed me to let this all go out there. And I hoped that it would help uh, men see that, you know, they're not alone if they're experiencing the same problems, you know. Number two, I wanted ladies to see and sisters to see that we do also have that issue. A lot of my uh, female uh, cousins and uh, sisters in the community have said, you have no idea. It's much easier for you. You get the pick of the litter, right? And I'm like, no, uh, not always, not always. Um, and then also it was great to be a part of the book in that we could show uh, people who are not Muslim reading the book that there's a you know, a wide cast of characters in the Muslim world and the, the, the concept of what is Muslim man in the news media is not the only way of thinking of, of men in America who are Muslim. Thank you. Well, Arif, I definitely have to say your story, I mean, I felt like I connected with, your, with yours the most. I think primarily because you were so open with your feelings. You know, because you don't hear a lot of guys talking about being rejected at all. I mean, women will come out and be like, yeah, he doesn't like me, I'm too this, I'm too that. But, like, guys, there's no, you guys just don't talk about it. So, like, as I was reading your story and you started talking about the chocolates, I was, I'm happy you read that excerpt, by the way. But <laughs> as, you were talk, as you were talking about the chocolates, I was like, oh, my God, like, this is sad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next question. Any other questions? Yep, right here. Could everybody hear her question? Everybody We're going to okay. have a special on Bravo where we all sit around the table. <laughs> um, no, we, uh, so just the nature of the project, there were short stories, and we had asked um, writers to sort of talk about a compelling uh, incident in their life that was meaningful to them. And so the writers really chose. Um, different ways to approach that. So both Molly and Arif's stories talk about sort of a period of their lives. You have other people who take us through an entire relationship um, from sort of, you know, in through their marriage. And so it varies. Um, but that's why we have the website. So with the Love and Shala writers, um, we've asked them all to sort of give a follow-up, and that's on our website. And I suspect we'll do the same thing um, with the male writers as well. Um, but Molly, where are you now? <laughs> now that it's been two years, I'd love to hear from you about how um, publishing your story has sort of changed things or if it hasn't changed things or what's sort of your take. Well, I, I wish I could say that I'm famous now, but <laughs> no one really cares. <laughs> <laughs> we care. <laughs> um, I, we are living in Minneapolis. I I'm working. Um, my husband is finishing up his schooling. Uh, still very happily married, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, I I, I would say that I, I I think that my story in particular is one of the more vanilla ones, which mm -hmm. is completely okay with me. And our ever after has kind of been pretty vanilla too, which is really okay with me. <laughs> so uh, I'm okay with uh, with yeah, I'm, I'm okay with not being you know famous. I do some writing. I, I work with a um, an Arab writing group uh, and and organization called Mizna, which is really really an awesome group. So. Occasionally, yes, I, I do occasionally get contacted from people um, through e for my email. I'm not sure how that happened, but and they'll ask me, you know, how are you? Do you have any advice? And so that's always um, that's always kind of fun and nice. It hasn't happened in a while, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty much it. That's where I am. All right, good. I mean, both of you guys' stories. I think it just speaks to the volumes of diversity in the men's book and in, in the women's book as well. So more of a reason to buy the book, okay? Um, buy it for your brother's sister, late Valentine's Day gift, maybe for your mama. Well, maybe not your mother, but <laughs> just buy it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so any other questions right here? Um, sort of leading into the 
Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, how do we negotiate some of the racier material and make editing decisions around what's included in the books? So um, that's a great question. And uh, it was on salon.com uh, that th there was an excerpt recently, and it actually deals with infidelity, um, an extramarital affair. And um, to be clear, like when there is an excerpt online, that's the decision of the editors. Feedback, the way in which to draw a story out of somebody. For, for, for example, because we're dealing with such diverse writers, um, it was, not, it was not uncommon for a writer to say, I grew up in a traditional South Asian family. And then so we would circle traditional and we would say, what does that mean? Because what's traditional to one person could be completely different to somebody else. So for that process, um, it was a real learning curve. So in, in many ways, editing the second book, and, and, and between the first book and the second book, we had our website. And so we were, I think, much better editors the second time around. And it was a lot easier too. Yeah. You want to add, Aisha? Can I ask you a follow-up question? Is a follow-up question? <laughs> <laughs> um, did you two find that you had to coax stories out more from men at all? Or was it, mm -hmm. it was, we were just blabbermouths. The men just arrived. You know, but yeah. comparatively, like, yeah. to getting submissions from the women compared to the guys, like, what are the numbers? If you guys could give us, like, an estimate. So over the course of five years, for the women, we had uh, over 200 submissions. And for the men, over the course of five months, we had about over 100 submissions. Okay. So a lot higher for the men. And that could very well be that the, you know, the first book was out and we had a bigger platform and more people knew about the book. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make one comment on the first, in the first collection. Aisha alluded to this earlier, but I think none of the writers from the first collection knew what they were getting into when they first we first put out that call for stories. I don't think any of them um, knew the extent to which the book, you know, how the book would do, what would be sort of the impact of their work. So I just want to say, you know, to Molly and the other writers that they were incredibly courageous to trust us um, and also to put their stories out there because there hadn't been anything like that before. And I think that we saw that in the editing process. So one of the stories that always comes to mind is a story by our writer, Suzanne Shah, who writes a story called Kala Love. Um, she's a Bangladeshi Muslim woman who writes about falling in love with an African-American man and her mom disowning her. And that story um, went through so many drafts. And it wasn't, I mean, she's a beautiful writer and um, just has an incredible lyric pro lyrical prose, but what we found is that there had been so much pain associated with that story that she had completely shut it off. Mm -hmm. She had just said, um, you know, this is me and this is my family and then I met my husband and then we got married and she had just completely shut down that part of her sort of experience. So there were so many drafts where we were trying to coax that story out of her and she let, later told us it was like peeling back the layers of an onion to get the story out. And I mean, sometimes the hardest stories are the stories you write about yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think any writer would probably agree with that. Um, okay, we have room for two oh, more questions. Make a comment? Well, want to comment? I just want to say that we had no idea <laughs> <laughs> what we were getting into. <laughs> I certainly didn't. I, I never thought when, you f when, when I was first contacted um, to submit, I thought that, oh, this is going to be, you know, those self-published books that nobody ever reads like they maybe print like 50 <laughs> copies and this is this is what I thought it was going to be and then I think it really hit me when in the New York Times article came out I was like I bought like 15 copies of the <laughs> New York Times I couldn't I couldn't believe that it became so big and I felt so honored to be a part of it but I had no idea that it was going to go there and I'm so thankful Okay, we have room for like two more questions. Um, I want to hear from the sisters because the brothers have been asking questions, you know, and this is like the time to, this is all about them. Come on now, sisters, we got to ask questions. Women, right there. Mm -hmm. 
Good question. Mm -hmm. I think we had one story about polygyny in the first collection. Um, uh, we didn't receive that story. There was someone who was interested in writing a story but um, did not send anything in in time for the deadline. All right. So we would have loved to actually have heard that story, yeah. actually. Yeah. All right, Molly has a question. <laughs> um, I want to kind of go back to the question about blowback because I one of the things in, in social media, when you guys put out the Muslim men calendar, <laughs> I want to hear about the blowback because what I saw was pretty interesting and I thought it was I thought it was fantastic what you guys put out. So I'm just curious like how that came about and what was some of the blowback on that because you guys want to tell everybody what you want to just tell everybody quickly what blowback what, what what it is though, what you're talking about so people know. <laughs> so we put out this calendar at the beginning of the year it was the hot muslim men of 2014 calendar it was on buzzfeed <laughs> and uh we were just having some fun and uh we actually so what we did was we had 12 men on this calendar and it was totally not sexual it was all about what makes you hot and that is your mind and your talents and so um we really wanted to sort of be provocative, but also sort of reassess the way that what's pinup worthy and what's hot. And we heard from people who said that we were sexualizing Muslim men and objectifying them. Um, <laughs> to which, <laughs> uh, I mean, if you read the calendar <laughs> and. <laughs> To which, uh, yeah, if you read the calendar, I think you would have seen that the title was sort of tongue-in-cheek. And so um, that was what happened. That was a couple, that was at the beginning of January. And I would say that um, we wanted to really talk about the power of words and how um, Muslim men specifically are defined and limited um, by other people saying who they are. And we wanted to really challenge that and celebrate our Muslim men by saying they are talented, successful, desirable, intelligent, and attractive because that's part of the package. And they were, you know, journalists and writers and all types of people were featured um, on this calendar. And we also really wanted to challenge, I think, the mainstream um, American idea of hot, which is purely limited often to a physical appearance by saying that it actually includes a number of other factors. As for the blowback, um, I think a lot of people understood it as satirical and um, laughed about it and shared it and saw it as a celebration of the diversity um, and beauty on many different levels of the Muslim community. But there were certainly people who um, thought it was immodest um, that we were, as Nora said, sexualizing Muslim men or objectifying them. And it actually, you know, I mean, Twitter can be sort of an interesting area, but it creates these really um, great opportunities for conversation. We may, we don't have to always agree. We have a very diverse community. We welcome divergent voices. If you don't agree with us, we want to hear from you. Um, we want you to consider writing for our website, um, you know, like, Come forward and tell your story. We don't always have to agree. Um, it is important, however, to witness each other's lives and stories, um, even if they're extremely different from our own. OK, all right, we have room for one last question. Let's hear from the brothers, since it's all about you guys tonight. <laughs> Who wants to go? Who right there? I mean. <laughs> There's a couple questions I have. The first is that ha what is the type of response that you got to receive from the imams? Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm asking this is because I've read the excerpts online, mm -hmm. and I heard your story, and I've also now heard your story as well, Molly. And so there's obviously a different spectrum. Uh, from yours being a, a very, uh, it's, it's a very good story. It, it resonates a lot with you know men that are in their you know in, in their subconscious. But when we talk about the other aspects of it, we're talking about the more um, uh, easy side of it, we're talking about infidelity. But at the same time, when we look at it, we're seeing like, you know, you read it and you actually give a name for something. So you're actually being described about this person committing something which is completely 
uh, or given a response with every single rep. So when I when when you when you read something like that and then you commentate it with Muslim society, you commentate it with Arab. I understand when you're talking about um, how you say that a description is always the best way to be intimate about something. But when you take something like that and you you know you show it to that extent, where a person can actually conceive the image in their mind of something that was haram and going on, right? How does that come to when you go to the Imam? Because this is obviously a, a conversation point. I understand mm -hmm. that it's to get to hear you talking about issues which are happening in our lives. But when we talk about agency for men, and as uh, Shai said that you know, is it a spatial thing or is it we don't have a space between us? But from you know from the viewpoint of like uh, not this is not a general viewpoint, but you know we look at it from the traditional Islam viewpoint. Why would you know if a men are having these types of issues because you're a, a stranger really? You're not in, you know, directly connected to us. So in society, we wouldn't go to a stranger woman and tell her the type of sexual um, you know, problems that are happening to us. Uh, it would be happening with imams. It would happen with people who are male usually. Right? It's just the way that the society works. I'm not, I'm not getting into a discussion about what is the right and what's wrong or how it works. But I'm just saying that so if you're taking something like this, which is a community starter, it's a conversation builder, and and when you get into, you said you, you're a civil worker, you're going to be looking for the youth, you're dealing with it, you're seeing that the youth, they're having problems with uh, expressing themselves in these situations. So now that you've come out with this, have you gone and have you got feedback from imams, from people or community leaders? I mean, what have they had a response to uh, this entire you know, project? That's a great question. Um, we have heard more. Um, I think when the first book came out, um, we heard from a number of imams and religious leaders um, who privately supported the book um, but did not want to make any public statements about it. And when the second book has only been out for, I think, less than two weeks, um, so on our tour, we have had some uh, leaders, various religious leaders and imams in some of our audiences who have actually come up to us afterwards and said that they want to have a conversation about this. They have not been surprised by any of the content, um, everything in the book. I think some people would try to characterize the books as um, progressive or unmasked people, um, their stories. But I think what's really important, um, and that's one of the reasons we included orthodox to secular and cultural voices, was all of these issues are happening inside and outside of the mosque in all communities. The specific story that you're talking about in Salon, which uh, deals with an extramarital affair, um, I mean, I think we can have a different discussion about whether or not there are certain details that should be in it or not, but the main um, what we've generally heard from feedback from men as well as religious leaders has been these are really important and real <coughs> issues that you've raised up and we do need to address them. Now the person who wrote that story under a pen name wrote it because he is embedded in um, a very religious Muslim community and he has seen the disconnect that happens when there's a silent vacuum created around issues of intimacy, relationship building, and sexuality um, when children are young in their teens and onwards. There is a complete silence in the family and parents and a lack of guidance. Um, so he talks about <coughs> growing up in that silence and sort of having to fend for himself and coming up with um, extremely warped ideas of what intimacy and relationships are actually about and how that severely impacts and undermines his marriage. I think these are incredibly important issues for us to be considering. Um, I have a four-year-old son. We're raising the next generation of American Muslims in this, in this nation. And how are we going to address these issues? As parents, we need to be informed. As religious leaders, we need to be informed. And we need to be the ones who are stepping forward to lead these discussions, not leading it, uh, leaving it for our children to be having um, their information from their peers who may be misinformed. Or, um, you know, like this person is someone who's embedded in an MSA, in a mosque, all of these sort of things, and yet has no support system. And when he goes to imams, 
<coughs> and uh, the elders uh, in his community, he's told like, it'll all be okay. He's not given anything concrete with which to work. This is like a real gap in our community. So I think, you know, I think you raise a great point. I mean, around how stories should be written and we can have a discussion around that. However, the feedback we've received um, from male and female readers and from leaders has been that these are issues that it's about time that we speak to. And I just add that, you know, we offer these books as a sort of a conversation starter. And so this is not the end. We hope it's not the end. And we've heard from a lot of people that it has started conversations within their families and communities and MSAs. And so we would love to continue that conversation and that dialogue. Um, and so we have been, as Aisha mentioned, we've been approached by imams who are interested in talking and we're more than happy to um, to, to, to enter, enter that conversation. All right, so that concludes Salam Love Book Reading. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, we'd like to thank, thank our sponsors, uh, Seminary Co-op Bookstores and I House for um, hosting us here. Uh, anybody else we have to thank? That's uh, it. The Center for Middle Eastern Studies at University of Chicago. Okay, Center for Middle Eastern Studies at <laughs> University of Chicago. Thank you, one of our sponsors. Um, there is also going to be a book signing as well. Remember, get your copy of the book for your mother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's it. Thank yeah. you very much. Round of applause. Oh, we're also online. We've plugged it a lot. Loveinshallah.com. And we're also on Facebook and Twitter. So please follow and like us. <laughs>